I hope that I'm <coughs> going to be able to make a contribution and to say something of interest. <coughs> but I also hope to learn something here. And one indication of that is that straight away, I'm going to ask you something. And I hope that you will respond in an appropriate way. By appropriate, I mean that you should indicate just what you feel and not what one should feel or what we feel. And the question I want to put to you is putting aside the truth or the falsity of the existence of a life after this, I want to ask you, would you hope, would you desire that there should be a life after this? So it's not about whether you believe it, but whether you wish that it was so. Or on the other hand, would you wish upon your death to just fizzle out to, to, in other words, go into something like oblivion or some kind of eternal rest or dreamless sleep. So what I would like, because as I said, I want to learn something. Those who, and don't look at your neighbor. Don't, I'm going to look at everyone's eyes. Don't look at what your neighbor is doing. If you want oblivion, please, when I give you the signal, hold up your right hand. And if you want uh, something after death, then please hold up your left hand. OK? Is that understood? So at the count of three, one, two, three. I should have got someone to uh, do this. OK, good, good, OK. Okay. You're holding up two hands. Uh, <laughs> okay. Now, um, I, I, I should have, but I don't want to be too pedantic about this, but I should have had some counter who would uh, do, give me some rough idea. But the way I estimate it is that uh, about one-third wish for oblivion and two-thirds for uh, something hereafter. OK, I'm going to put that aside and come back to it. Uh, but now I'll, I'll be getting, getting to my lecture proper. And I believe that there are six or seven serious main forms of after death existence. And these are, and I thought it'd be useful because uh, I, I hope probably not to have to refer to the full, the full titles. And I can just refer either to the numbers or uh, a kind of one word, such as for two reincarnation. But let me, let me just mention them. And I'll come back and say a word about them. First of all, there is disembodied realm of heaven and hell. Secondly, reincarnated persons. Thirdly, resurrected bodies. Then, pure indivisible minds. Brahman consciousness or moksha or nirvana. Dream image world. And then, oblivion or, or extinction. OK. I've, I've, <coughs> I've done the preface. So now I want to say a word about these uh, six or seven main forms of after-death existence or possible after-death existences. And the first thing is that number one is a form that comes in at least three species or varieties. First of all, Plato, and particularly in Plato's Republic, the myth of air, 
where he talks about the uh, realm of heaven and hell that uh, people go to for rewards and punishments, then Dante in the Divine Comedy, and then finally Swedenborg. And I think that these are the three great proponents of heaven and hell. I can't think of anyone who comes up to them in the uh, profundity and the, the broadness of the vision. There are differences, important differences, though, between them. So uh, for Dante, there is not just, there, there isn't a, uh, a final heaven and hell existing now, but in fact it's an interim heaven and hell which is going to be replaced by the final one at the uh, end of the world, at the resurrection of the dead, and uh, finally the distribution into heaven and hell. There's no preparatory or middle uh, realm for Dante because uh, it, it isn't appropriate since that's going to come at the last judgment. For Plato there is, but it's not nearly as elaborate as it is in Swedenborg. I think Swedenborg is at his most profound in his account of what goes on in what he calls the world of spirits, which basically, and probably I'm, I'm, I'm uh, carrying calls to Newcastle, but basically it is the realm or, or the ante room where uh, a unity of person is achieved which hasn't been achieved in this world because we are all over the place. But in the world of spirits, the individuals have their understanding and their desire brought into a unity so that it can, this unified person can go uh, to either heaven or hell, which, which seems appropriate. Why, why should there be uh, someone in hell who has partly a good understanding but bad desire or vice versa? Okay. Reincarnation also uh, happens in Plato and in Hinduism and in Buddhism. Not, apart from Plato, it's not, uh, it's not a, a common view in the West. But I think, in fact, it has a great deal more to be said for it than uh, it's given credit for. Uh, and I think what confuses things is the whole question of memory, which, which uh, really, I think, is irrelevant to the question of reincarnation. But since my purpose here is not to consider the, 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 the really big picture, but to focus on Swedenborg and heaven and hell, I'm going to uh, leave that for the moment, or in fact, leave that for this evening. Now I come to the most influential account of after-death existence, and that is certainly resurrection of the dead, because resurrection of the dead uh, has been the main view of both Christianity and uh, Islam. And it goes with uh, Dante, it doesn't go with Plato, and it doesn't go with Swedenborg, and I'll, and I'll come back to that uh, just in a moment. There's a fair amount of scholarly debate about how far uh, resurrection of the dead is true Christianity. I think the general view now is that it is, and it was the view of the early Christians, and it's also, I think, uh, the view of the fundamentalists 
but not just the fundamentalists, but also those who believe in going back to what's called primitive Christianity. But I'm not going to get into the scholarly debate because I, I really desire to make a cleaner, more direct point in this respect. Most, nearly all Christians, or I should say nearly all philosophically or educated Christians in the 18th century accepted both resurrection of the dead and also a, a, uh, a fourth a fourth form of after death existence, namely pure indivisible minds. And, and that doesn't come in any scripture or revelation that comes from pure philosophy and reason. And the basic idea is that consciousness or thinking arises from a non-extended, indivisible subject. That is the I. And this is uh, a, an argument that goes back to Plato, but its more recent champion is Descartes. And it brings about, Descartes brings, is regarded as the father of modern philosophy, uh, rightly so. And it brings about a whole new development in uh, psychology and philosophy, dualism. But what I want to focus on is that this idea of uh, existence in the next life as a pure indivisible substance or mind comes completely from reason and was the accepted view in uh, the late 17th century, then 18th century, but came under fire particularly from Kant and uh, in the 19th century uh, lost its, its, its almost universal acceptance. And now in the 20th century, it's, it, or the 21st century, it's, it's no longer the flavor of the month. But it was the flavor of the month or the flavor of the century in Swedenborg's time. And so uh, it was accepted not only by Descartes, but also by Leibniz, by uh, Barclay and by Wolf, who, who is meant to be a important influence on Swedenborg. Then now just to, to go through quickly, then uh, the fifth form of after death existence is perhaps the hardest to pin down because it comes from a culture which is not uh, the Western culture, and that is the Hindu idea of Brahman consciousness or moksha, which I, I suppose the most direct way of getting to is to say that it is a monistic experience which brings about the release of the individual into a kind of undifferentiated condition of being. Or uh, I think the formula is that Atman is Brahman. In other words, the self, if, it, if, if it's understood properly by the sage, by the wise man, is understood to be existence. And so the, the aim is to overcome individual personal existence and, and achieve this perfect state and thereby be released from the wheel of reincarnation because 
according to Hinduism as I understand it, and I suppose I should confess that I'm being guided to some extent by, by Schopenhauer, according to Hinduism, individual personal existence is not only an illusion, but is the basis of our suffering. And so getting into this oneness is the way of overcoming our suffering and achieving the truth of oneness. But <clears throat> even getting into this undifferentiated state of consciousness does seem to leave open the possibility that something might either arise or change from this perfect state. And I think that explains the next development and the next great individual, namely uh, Buddhism and the Buddha, because the aim in Buddhism is to take, I think, uh, the Hindu idea of moksha or undifferentiated consciousness one step further into nirvana, which is nothingness. So nothing is the best guarantee of not falling back into the illusion and suffering of individual personality. Number six is, is rather more positive, and that is that there should be, or there could be, uh, an after-death existence which consists of a personal consciousness and an image body in which the uh, personal consciousness that has this image body is experiencing other images. And then finally, I need to just come back in a way to the, the question that I asked, namely to the uh, seventh form of after-death existence, that is oblivion or extinction, or I think getting cl closest to it, in my view, is how it's understood by Pliny, that is perfect rest, perfect rest after a life of activity or perhaps we could get to it even, even better, but I suppose at the risk of falsifying it somewhat, dreamless sleep. I don't know whether you've had the experience, but there, I think there is something wonderful about uh, waking up from a completely dreamless sleep and feeling wasn't that, wasn't that really fine and don't I feel better for having come through that experience. So there is something positive and perhaps too positive about uh, dreamless sleep, but it gets to the idea of oblivion and extinction. Okay, so now I've summarized, I've summarized the seven forms of after-death existence, and now I want to uh, come back to Swedenborg, who, who is the, the focus of my lecture, and say something which I think I personally can make a contribution on. Uh, I don't think there, I, 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 I probably shouldn't be too kind of um, proud of myself and blowing my own trumpet, but uh, in the early 70s, I was, I was asked to uh, contri contribute to a Swiss encyclopedia on an article a kind of historical scholarly article on the debate uh, on the immortality of the soul in the 18th century. And at the time, I was a sort of, you know, I was eager to publish and all that. And so I took on this, this burden, really, of reading dozens of 18th century treatises and pamphlets on the immortality of the soul and uh, spending a huge amount of time in the British Library across the way. And uh, so 
I feel that I do know something more than most scholars about the scene on immortality of the soul in the 18th century. And, you know, once you start off in a scholarly project, you, 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 you learn the kind of basics, then you're tempted to do other things. So over the years, I've done uh, five fairly big projects on the immortality of the soul. And uh, so I feel that in, not in many areas in philosophy, but in this area, I, I, I feel that uh, my judgment is worth something. So what is my judgment? Why am I, why am I going through this long-winded spiel about uh, how well qualified I am? My judgment is this, that Swedenborg is amazingly unique and isolated in the 18th century. That in all of my reading, I couldn't find, or didn't find, I didn't know about Swedenborg then, but I, reflecting on it, looking back on it, there's no one who takes up the position that he takes up. Now, there, there are a number of uh, possibilities, basically four. The orthodox view in the 18th century was that we, we can know what is going to happen to us in the next life because we learn it both from revelation, and that, that's the story about the last judgment and resurrection of the dead, and also from philosophy, and that's the story that we get from Descartes and dualism. And it was thought that the two beautifully fitted together because reason, independent of revelation, tells us that we are going to survive because, as I reviewed, rehearsed the argument, an indivisible substance can't be destroyed because uh, how can something which is basically a spiritual atom decay or be dissolved or be cut into pieces? It can't. An atom is indestructible, and so we know we're going to survive, and Christianity tells us how we're going to survive. So it was thought to be a very nice combination, and for that reason, it was the accepted view. But as I, as I mentioned, even back in the 18th century, there were the fundamentalists like Joseph Priestley, who totally opposed resurrection of the dead, because, sorry, totally opposed the philosophical view, the dualism coming from Descartes and Plato, because he thought that it was not to be found at all in the scriptures. And, and as I said, the scholarly opinion nowadays is that Priestley was right, that it was a kind of pagan or secular imposition on uh, the, the Christian uh, Christian idea of his life. And then there were, on the other hand, uh, philosophers like Leibniz and probably Descartes himself who, uh, because they were kind of operating in the, the age of reason and they were uh, into uh, the latest developments, and because they, they were just uh, believers in independent thinking, they came to the conclusion that revelation was mistaken. So basically, they were deists, and they believed in immortality not at all in line with uh, revelation, but completely in line with reason. So. Uh, the, 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 there was that group. And then there was a fourth group, namely the what I call the theological liars, and my best example of theological liars, David Hume, who uh, claimed that he believed in 
uh, revelation, but really believed in nothing. And we know, as a matter of fact, that he didn't believe in an afterlife because uh, Boswell, the great journalist, went to see him just before he was going to die and put it to you, did he believe? And you was completely candid and said that he didn't believe at all. And not only did he not believe that there was going to be any next life, but he hoped that there wouldn't be. And as a matter of interest, he's the first uh, individual who, as far as I know, in modern times has gone on record as saying that he not only didn't believe it, but he hoped that it wouldn't happen. So what is the conclusion I want to draw? I, I want to draw, I think, a surprisingly interesting conclusion, particularly for those of you who uh, are drawn to uh, Swedenborg's uh, writings and message. And that is that since Swedenborg was so isolated, so heterodox, that we can't explain his views coming from his, his desire. I mean, for one thing, his father, who he, who he had enormous admiration for, his father published a uh, uh, defense of the, the resurrection. And, and so Swedenborg, in rejecting the, the resurrection of the dead, was not only going against the churchmen, as he calls them, but also against his father. He, Swedenborg rejects the resurrection in um, a number of places, but I think the most interesting is in Heaven and Hell, section 312. He's very clear that it is a profoundly erroneous view, and it, he felt it leads to many other erroneous views. But he also uh, talks about an the um, resurrection of the dead in uh, his last book, The True Christian Religion, and also the interaction of the soul and the body. So he, 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 is, he is not in the kind of fundamentalist line at all. And, and uh, so we might expect, we might expect him to go the deistic way. And he's very, Interestingly, he's very deistic in his criticism of uh, the resurrection of the dead. He, 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 he sounds like uh, a deist because he, he, he's using all of this, this completely uh, rational, philosophical, and partly scientific uh, criticism. But he doesn't go the philosophical way because he also rejects, and, and particularly the best place to look is in the Arcanis Celestia uh, section, uh, what is it, section uh, 743 to 747. He also rejects the dualistic Cartesian view. He thinks that uh, it is totally mistaken to suppose that um, souls or spirits are indivisible, pure minds. Because for him, they are compounds. And not only compounds, but they have the, the, the very shape that we have in this life, except they're not material. They're not embodied. Spirits, spirits are... Uh, extended but unbodied beings. And, and I, I, want to, I want to come back to that, but I hope I've made my point that Swedenborg is so much a minority of one that it's hard to understand where he is coming from except to take him at his word that he doesn't know about 
the next life from revelation, and he doesn't know about it from philosophy, and he does believe in it because he's not like Hume and uh, the, the, uh, the atheists. So where does he, how does he come to know it? Well, I, I think uh, from what he says, he knows it from experience, from hearing and seeing. Of course, uh, the critic is going to say, yes, that's what he believed, but did he really have the experience? Well, my reply to that is, if, if all he wanted to do was believe in the next life, he took a very kind of indirect and um, tortuous way of getting there when he had the, the clear options of reason and revelation. Okay, so now I move on and uh, I think it's important to be candid here that, that even if we want to be sympathetic, and I do want to be sympathetic, and I have a reason for being sympathetic, which uh, draws on uh, Freud's idea of an illusion. Because I think that there is an illusion of mortality which is prevalent today, which I feel should be opposed. What, 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 what uh, do I mean or what did Freud mean by an illusion? An illusion is not something which is false, but something which is believed largely because it's desired. And Freud, in The Future of an Illusion, uh, says that we, we think it's very nice if there is a God and if there is a life after death. So he thinks, he thinks that the, the, the illusion is the illusion of immortality. And I think that if he said that 200 years before, he would be right. 200 years before, the consensus was that there is a life after death and that it's a good thing. But I don't think that Freud is right to say that the present illusion is an illusion of immortality, that is a desire for immortality, because for one thing, he should have known the two out of the four great religions, that is Hinduism and Buddhism, don't desire a life after death, that it's not the good news because life after death means another failure and being caught again on the wheel of reincarnations. So it's not as though we can be sure or we can say that we desire this, but rather, rather that it depends. And that's, that was the point of my, uh, my initial question about what you desire. And it turned out rather nicely, in fact, because I would have expected that at a meeting of the Swedenborg Society that the great, possibly I, I, I was dreading the possibility that everyone here would be desiring immortality. But no, one third, roughly, wanted uh, extinction or oblivion. And I think that shows that Freud was wrong. It's not a matter of we, it's a matter of what a type of individual wants. So I would say there is a natural, a kind of intrinsic Hindu Buddhist type, and you don't have to be an Indian to, uh, to, to have this. And there's, on the other hand, a more Christian Islamic type that does desire life after death. And, and 
I was going to sort of give my lecture to a great extent as a sort of, well, to some extent as, a, as a, an autobiographical, uh, in an autobiographical mode of presentation and talk about how I personally came to take this subject seriously and very briefly it, it came about 20 years ago as a, as, uh, as a result of a kind of what you might call a dark night of the soul concerning death where I uh, suffered quite a lot and also learned quite a lot and had my thinking move from one trajectory to another and theoretically the trajectory that I started on and have continued on to the present is, I, I, I suppose, best expressed in, in a way following William James as what I call the typical mind fallacy, which I think is, is the great fallacy uh, in, in uh, modern philosophy and psychology, and that is the supposition that there's a typical mind or that the human mind is uniform. And I think that is shown to be false, not just from uh, the fact that there are these two great religious traditions, one that wants life after death and believes in life after death, that is the Christian and Islamic, and the other that doesn't, namely the Hindu and the Buddhist, but also the little the little quiz that, that I started things off with. If one third of you don't want it, then that shows, uh, perhaps not demonstrates, but certainly is prima facie evidence that at this deep level, human beings are not the same. Now, I could come back to this but if we have time, and I'm not sure how, how much, how, where, how, how, how long have I been uh, rambling on? 40 minutes. I have got to move quickly then. Okay. Very quickly. Very, very quickly. So what are the problems? I mean, I, I've, given, I've given some kind of uh, indication that because of Swedenborg's isolation in the 18th century that his belief expressed in the uh, celestial canon, heaven and hell, that there is this next world as he describes it, has some, some grip that, it, that it, since it's not what we would expect from uh, a, a, an intelligent man of that time, that it's very idiosyncratic, it's very uniqueness uh, suggests that it comes from a legitimate source. Now it doesn't prove it, but I think it suggests that it comes to a legitimate, from a legitimate source. So what are the problems? I, I've, I've alluded to, I think, one of the main problems in Swedenborg's uh, account, that is that he, he's asking us to believe that there is this disembodied realm of heaven and hell, and yet at the same time, he concedes, of course he has to concede, that there, there are no bodies. So how can you have an extended compound uh, being, person, w without any um, extension? Or, or to put it another way, where is this place? Where is heaven and hell. Now, when, when Plato was writing and when Dante were writing, uh, the earth was not known, the solar system was not known, and so it was possible for them to believe and to say that the hell was under the ground, long way under the ground, and heaven was up in the uh, sky or space. But uh, in the 17th century and even more in the 18th century and now uh, absolutely in the 21st century, we know too much about 
the, the underground of the earth, the depths of the earth, and we know too much about space to believe that heaven is up there and hell is down there. So where are they? Where are they? That's one problem. Another problem is if there is so much activity in the next life, and according to Swedenborg, there, there is, because all human beings have been going there since the very beginning. Why is there not more communication from the next life? And other problems like where we have to understand the next life as a, a way, a form of existence, a pervasive way in which the uh, deceased are living, but yet it has to be alien to our world because uh, it's a disembodied world for one thing, and also, as Swedenborg says, uh, as it goes deeper into hell and as it goes higher up into heaven, it becomes even more alien. For one thing, the, as, I, as I said at the beginning and, and said it's, it's one of the best things I think in Swedenborg, that the beings in heaven and hell have passed through the spirit world are unified in a way that we human beings are not. We're, th there's no self-deception in the next world, whereas we, our lives are, are, are full of self-deception. So what, what, is the, what is the answer? Now, th when I was going to do this in an autobiographical way, I was going to tell you, and I suppose I might as well still tell you, that about five years ago, I had one of those little epiphanies and it, and it went like this. It was a really, in a way, started off quite modestly. I, I, I thought to myself, when I'm dreaming, I don't know that I'm dreaming. I think that I am doing these things. Like, um, I remember I had a dream once where I introduced my grandmother to Einstein. So I, I believe that I was doing that when I was dreaming. Of course, when I woke up, then I knew that uh, it was a dream. And, I, and, and, and I, I should have known if I was lucid because my grandmother was dead and of course Einstein was dead and the, the, the likelihood that I was going to introduce them was pretty, pretty uh, tiny. But it's also the case, as I knew from uh, various readings, particularly C.D. Broad's lectures on psychical experience, psychical experience, that the recent dead, according to the work that comes from mediums, the recent dead don't know that they're dead. And you find this uh, in quite a number of places. For example, uh, Yeats talks about it in his introduction to Lady, Lady Gregory's work on folklore. But it's most striking place is in Swedenborg's work. He's quite clear that, uh, that nearly all the dead don't know that they're dead initially, and some of them take years to discover. For example, his old teacher, Polum, uh, was one of these, that, that in the spiritual diary, Swedenborg says that he, his Polum died on the, on the Monday, and he went to his funeral on the Thursday, and he was in communication with Polum as uh, he was attending the funeral. And Polum said to him, why are they burying me? And uh, he, Swedenborg had to give him the bad news that uh, he was dead. So in a word, I thought, if the dead don't know that they're dead and dreamers don't know that they're dreaming, then isn't it possible that the dead are in a state of dream life. And so I thought, you know, that, that's neat. And I, 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 you know, thinking always of publication, I said I might get a publication out of this. So I started to do some research. And before I knew it, I found out that uh, it was very much uh, an accepted view in Tibetan Buddhism. There's this idea 
of the bardo, which is the place that uh, the dead go just after they <coughs> they've died, and which is uh, an illusory dream image world, and it's also to be found in uh, in Hinduism in the uh, Kama Loka, and it's even to be found in Islam, surprisingly, in what's called the Barzak, which is the intermediary realm between <coughs> this life and resurrection of the dead. And, and then when I looked a little further, I found that in Tyler's primitive culture, one of the great works of anthropology of the 19th century, that's what Tyler says was the original religion of uh, the human beings, animism. According to the animus, spirits are dream uh, beings. And then I found that it goes all the way back to St. Augustine, that in a, uh, a letter, St. Augustine tells us about a, a very pious uh, physician called Gennadius, and Gennadius had an experience in, in two lucid dreams where he discovered that there was a next life and it was a dream life. Uh, really quite a striking and, and uh, important letter. And then I found out that the man who invented the term lucid dreaming also uh, in the course of his uh, work he, 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 he had something like a thousand lucid dreams. He um, believed that he was in contact in some of the lucid dreams with uh, actual deceased persons. He said it was very rare. And he said often he had lucid dreams in which spirits tried to convince him that they were real when, when it turned out that they were somehow um, bits of his mind that were going crazy. So I, I, I discovered that uh, what I thought really had been uh, around for quite a while, but not, and this is the point, not in a very clear way, that usually when they talked about uh, when they talked about, for example, in, uh, in, in Tibetan Buddhism, they talk about this world of illusions. They, 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 they don't focus in a clear way on the idea that it's a dream life. They use that as a kind of metaphor. But the next, the next kind of moment in my, um, my, my kind of uh, discoveries was I found out that a, a, a really quite important but not very great Oxford philosopher called H. H. Price had developed this theory in a very clear and admirably analytic way in 1953. So I was so I, I in one way I was very annoyed because I, I no longer had this possibility to present the world with this discovery. But at the same time, I was relieved. I'm not a very good analytic philosopher, whereas Price was. And so he saved me the trouble of having to um, develop the theory in the way required by contemporary analytic philosophy. And since I don't want to, to go on too long, let me, let me now uh, get to the punchlines. The first punchline is that if we put together all of this stuff that I've been talking about, but basically the idea that what the next life is, is a condition of image dreaming, with Price, who, who kind of brings it all together, but not perfectly, because he also isn't uh, 
clear that it's literally dreaming. But if we then add in Swedenborg, we have a very powerful theory. Why? Because Price is doing it in a completely conceptual way, because he's, he's, a, he's a believer that philosophers uh, can't really talk about what exists, but they can um, produce highly consistent and coherent theoretical uh, constructs. And he thinks that he has shown that the idea of the next life as a dream image world is completely coherent and consistent, but he says he doesn't have any evidence because he's not a scientist that it actually does exist that way. It's only that it's, it's coherent and that, that uh, it could be the case. Now, Swedenborg, on the other hand, never suggests that the world that he's visited is a dream image world. But it would provide him with just the, the ontology that he needs, I think, in order to answer questions like, how can there be uh, spirits that are extended but not embodied? Because images, mental images, are just that. It's th that's not, a, it's not such an obvious thing, but if you, if you form a mental image, say, of a face, and look at the image that you're having, you realize that there is extension or space between the two ears. So uh, we do have something, an image is not bodily. There's no, there's no physical thing there, although some, uh, I think, rather naive neuroscientists believe that they uh, can talk about images being in the brain. I don't think that uh, images can be in the brain because uh, no one, you can't imagine, say, if I have an image of, of my mother's face, neuroscientists being able, with, with even the most perfect uh, microscope, taking a picture and being able to see my mother's face, if he took a picture of my brain, seeing my mother's face in my brain. Brains are not composed of portraits. They're not composed of pictures. They're com composed of neur neurons and synapses and, and uh, that sort of thing. Okay, you can tell this is a kind of uh, bee in my bonnet that I'm caught in. Now, the, 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 I'm, I'm in the, la the, last, the last leg of this journey. The, um, the problem that Swedenborg would probably have had with the hypothesis or the theory that I'm presenting, that is the union of all of his empirical data, all of his circumstantial descriptions of what goes on in the next life, and bringing that as the concrete evidence fitting into the theory that what is actually there from a strictly uh, ontological or physical point is dream image, is the notion that dreams are somehow not real, that they're, 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 they're kind of illusions. And I think this, this, is, this is the big mistake that uh, one is prone to commit with something like dreams. And I think Freud, Freud uh, who, 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 who was a great um, discoverer of the unconscious, uh, is, is guilty of this. And that is not recognizing the broadness of um, a field. For example, uh, Freud is probably, you know, thought that, that all, all dreams are wishes fulfilled, wish fulfillments. 
uh, I practiced or I, I trained as a as a analyst and always had a problem with that because unfortunately nearly all my dreams are disagreeable. So how how was I able and and I I, I um, had a real problem with that, but I was helped by Wittgenstein, who uh, in one of his conversations said that all of his dreams were, or most of his dreams were disagreeable also, and he thought that Freud was just wrong. And here's another example of what I call the typical mind fallacy. Freud had, and so he imagined that that was the way all dreams uh, existed. But I know that my dreams are fears fulfilled. And uh, I think I'm well, I, what it means, I'm not really sure. But I'm convinced that dreams need to be divided in that way. But the most important division is the distinction between normal dreaming and lucid dreaming. Has everyone here had at least one lucid dream? You know what I mean? A lucid dream is a dream in which you know that you're dreaming in the way that Gennadius knew that he was dreaming and also um, Van Eden, the, the, the Dutch psychologist who invented the term lucid dreaming, certainly did since he had over a thousand that he recorded. So lucid dreaming is a very different way of dreaming and yet as great as, uh, well, I was going to say as great a philosopher. He wasn't really a great philosopher, but a, but a really very good philosopher, the American philosopher Norman Malcolm, who wrote a book on dreaming, said that it was impossible to have a dream in which you knew you were dreaming. He thought it was impossible. And uh, a, a psychologist who was very celebrated in the 19th century, Havelock Ellis, also thought that. Norman Malcolm not only thought that lucid dreams were impossible, but he thought normal dreams were impossible as well. And he thought that what actually happens is that uh, you wake up and you tell yourself a story. You actually have any dreams. Now, what is interesting is that there have been important developments, especially in lucid dreaming, in the past 25 years. And the, the big development is that now, not only do, do most people know from their own experience that they've had dreams, but it's possible through brain scanning and an insight that a, a psychologist had to prove lucid dreaming, and not prove lucid dreaming, but to be able to communicate with a lucid dreamer. How is this possible? This psychologist realized or discovered that when you are in a dream, you are, not, you are completely immobile except for one part of your body, your eyes. You can move your eyes in dream, dreams and in lucid dreaming. And so uh, by hooking someone up to a scanner and by a signal, they were able to objectively prove that someone was in a lucid dream state. And so lucid dreaming has taken off. And for those of you who are interested, you should go to the website Lucidity Dreaming, which is a institute part of the, the Stanford University, where you'll find plenty of information on lucid dreaming. OK, why am I? Why am I going this way? Because I think there is a way that F Swedenborg, Swedenborg's main idea that there is a other world of spirits, heaven, demons, and angels can be verified objectively of lucid dreaming. Those of you who've had one or two lucid dreams won't be able to do what I'm suggesting. But there are some people, and for all I know, there might be here, 
who are what I call expert lucid dreamers. And you have to be an expert lucid dreamer to do this. And, and how do I know this? Well, I know this partly because I have read a, a number of books, but also I've, I've been able to talk to some experts. And particularly, I have two students who, for just as it turns out, have this talent for expert lucid dreaming. Why does it require talent? Because the difficulty with lucid dreaming is to uh, have many of them and be able more or less to have them at will. But secondly, to be able to sustain the lucid dreaming. But even more than that, now I take it one step further, to be able to have a lucid dream in which they're not doing things like having sex or winning the World Cup, because that's very tempting uh, if you're a good lucid dreamer. You can, you can have those experiences that are virtually indiscernible from the real experiences, but to investigate in a scientific way what is actually happening in that world that you are in. Why it's, so, why it's so difficult is that in order to investigate what is actually happening, you have to, you have to know what you're involved in without having to tell yourself that it's a dream. Now, why, why you have to do that thing which sounds so paradoxical is for most people who have a lucid dream, once they stop realizing it's a dream, sorry, it's a lucid dream, they slip into the normal dream. You have to know, for the most part, that the dream is lucid, or then you are just dreaming in the normal way, namely not realizing that you're dreaming. But if you're constantly telling yourself that it's a lucid dream, then you're taking up the awake, this worldly position, and then you're not an impartial investigator into what's going on. And I hope that point is clear. And that shows that there are going to be very, very few lucid dreamers, expert lucid dreamers, who can verify, say, meeting a, uh, a deceased person. But what, what would they do if they meet, met a deceased person? And here, I think we can on Swedenborg himself and his two famous, um, the two famous stories, namely the Queen's, the Queen's Secret and the Hidden Receipt. I, I'm assuming that, you, that most of you know about them, and if you don't, you can ask someone afterwards. But the uh, idea is that the expert lucid dreamer should have some modified form of, say, the hidden receipt. Let, let, let me give you a fast example. Supposing, OK, OK, I have to get the punch. The, supposing, I, this, this is where I finish. Supposing that um, my grandfather told me that I was going to get a gold watch, but when, uh, and it was in his will, but he never said where it was. So supposing I get, uh, or supposing I am an expert lucid dreamer, I have a dream in which I meet my grandfather and he says, and I say, you told me you were going to give me this gold watch, where is it? And he says, it's underneath the fifth floorboard blah, 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 and we go to the fifth floorboard and we find it. Can I doubt that I met my grandfather? Could you doubt that in a similar case you were in contact with someone deceased? Okay, that's it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, happy questions. 
So I'll, I'll take it by turn. You, sir, please. Thank you very much for hearing the Dean of Well, I, I, that's a good question, and it's a helpful question because, and I hope I'm not going to sound uh, you know, I, I, negative, but I think that uh, in the in the occult tradition and in in Tibetan Buddhism, there's this kind of wobbly between the image body and the subtle or astral body or or subtle body, and I think that that. Uh, it's not going to be the subtle body that's going to help us if we want to go the dream way. It's going to be the image body. I think that uh, not, not being clear that it's, an, it's a dream state, but not a dream state in the sense that it's not real. Images and dreams, as, as probably most of you know, can be more real than reality. They can have, they can grip us in, a, in, a, in a both a terrible and a wonderful way. So uh, it, it's real, but m most importantly, it offers a way of getting to verification. Yes, I think I've heard that. Yeah. Yes. I, in a way, I, I tried to cover that when I spoke about the, the conditions for understanding the after-death existence. Near-death experience is not a condition of, it's not a way of being in the afterlife. It's, it's, it's a bit of evidence about the connection between this life and the next life. Similarly, uh, it wouldn't do to, to, for me to have brought in as one of my six or seven forms of after-death existence uh, hallucinogenic existence. So I, I, I don't think that, uh, that near-death experience, which is really the flavor of the month, you know, I mean, th there's a lot of excitement around that and people think that somehow it's going to provide a way of justifying it I don't think it, it, it's, it's in conflict with what I'm saying because I'm not, I'm not talking about uh, evidence or, or the connection between this world and the next world, but I'm talking about the way the next world exists. Does that make sense? No. Okay. <laughs> so why doesn't it make sense? But, but they no I'm not no I wasn't that that, that wasn't my point it, it was only that uh, what I was trying to find were ways of pervasively being in the next life not not uh, not examples of what happens in this life that can then be sort of blown up 
and uh, can be made to, to function as the way that it is in the next life. If you see what I mean, now you might say kind of having an orgasm is the way that it would be for heavenly beings. But that's only one way in which human beings can experience things. Similarly, hallucinogenics are one way, a very kind of different way from our normal way. But I would, I would, I would say the same about um, near-death experience, that it, 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 it's, not, uh, it's not a way of existing, but it's a way of uh, entering in or believing that uh, one is making contact with the next life. I mean, look, it's, it's called near, near death experience, which I think has to be indicative. It's not death experience, it's near. They're, they're coming close to it. It's like, you know, if, if the, the, the analogy would be uh, trying, to, to, trying to understand what it's like in a house but having just kind of got into the into the threshold of the house. But then why do you give um, more credibility to the to, to bodies? To what? You, you give credit to the Dubado state that's five by the death. Well the Dubado state can uh, it lasts less uh, a, a, a period of time. Whereas whereas I understand a near death experience doesn't go on. The Bado experience can last weeks. Yes, but the experience of the body Okay. Okay. Well, you know, it's not. I. I don't think that it's necessary for me to debunk near-death experiences, but I don't think that it's a. It's a challenge to the the dream image theory that I am uh, trying to defend. Well, it's the near death. The, the near death is not robust enough. I mean, I think that it's uh, you know we we have some examples of it, but I wouldn't like. Okay, and I well we be repeating ourselves. Yeah. I think this lady was first. I think this okay. lady was first. Oh. different because if, if space is different yes. then why shouldn't time be different yeah I I, uh, I think that 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 is um, it's suggestive and I think that uh, probably probably it's going to turn out if, if this does actually have something to recommend it it's going to turn out that time is different in, and, and isn't time different in dream dream world yeah. Yeah. I I I think you're right. I think you're right. You sir, please. May I suggest that we are all already dead, but most of us don't realize. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, yes, yeah. Yeah. Well, in a way, there, there are a lot of uh, complementary or supplementary elements that can be brought in. For example, I, I, I see no reason why 
uh, we should dismiss the, the work with mediums. And, and uh, Price thought that that was, if the evidence for his theory was going to come from anywhere, it would be with work in mediums uh, and also the work that was being done by the Society for Psychical Research. And he thought that it already supported a fair bit of his theory. So uh, I'm, I'm not for debunking any of it, but at the same time, I'm not for accepting it. And probably someone is going to ask me what I really believe. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you that, that uh, I, I, I don't yet believe it. But every time I think about it, nearly, I get a little bit closer to believing it. Michael? Uh, just to clarify what Sweetenball actually wrote, uh, on the matter of spirits, there have all been people living in this world before they become spirits. Yes. They were far from being disembodied, but Sweetenball states that they are in a substantial body. Uh, that's very essential. They are in a body. Who would know it? It he says that our body in the natural world is relatively, being material, less substantial than the one we already have, which we're growing inside as our spiritual being. Just, just, just to okay, but what do you mean by substantial? I well, think that I don't. Uh, I, 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 my, my recollection is he doesn't use the term substantial, but, but solid. I mean, it's, it's solid in that it's tactual in the same way that what, what he sees, but that, that doesn't preclude the uh, solidity being of the image kind because you can have extremely uh, vivid, lively uh, dream images. In other words, sensations, what we would call sensations. Thanks. Alan? I, I, I don't think I would disagree with that, but what I want to emphasize is that the, the dream world, I, I like to refer to it as this, the dream sea, the sea of dreams. It's big enough and it has the capacity not only for the kind of um, shallow dreams that most of us have, but for the kind of deep dreams that the, the seers have. And I think that the way I, the, the way I imagine it is that Swedenborg went one step further than being an expert lucid dreamer, that he had a kind of one in a million uh, talent probably resulting from those, those crisis dreams that he had in the 1740s for awake experience of dream individuals. You see, going one step further than lucid dreaming.
So it was, I was going up to the stairs and there was a, a picture of the window, a uh, picture of the wall, and I, one technique was if you see something, because it is a dream, you want to make it more lucid, try and magnify it or look at it more closely. So I turned my head and moved my head towards the picture and got closer to it, and then I moved my head away again. Unfortunately, I'm not a good lucid dreamer, so I'm the wrong person to ask. You should ask one of my two students. But I know from reading that what they say is, to begin with, you want to keep a dream diary and uh, to become more and more aware and remember more and more of your dreams. That's the first step. The second thing is that as you're walking along, you should be saying to yourself things like, is this a dream? Because the more you say that to yourself, the more likely, when you're in a dream, you'll be able to make it lucid. Well, you see, if you think about it, and I, there was a quote from Nietzsche that I was going to read. If you think about it, uh, what, no, what, how, how shall I put this? What sort of pervasive human activity is like awake this life, but totally different? And I think the answer is, there's one answer, and that is the dream. That, that it's, it's, Nietzsche says in this quote, he says, there would never have been metaphysics, and he hates metaphysics, and he says there never would have been a whole mind-body problem, and there never would have been talk of the afterlife if it wasn't for dreams. So he's negative about metaphysics, the mind-body, and the afterlife, but he admits that it's the dream phenomenon that comes closest to giving us the idea of another life. Like this one, but different. And, and I'm always frustrated at how, when I come back from a dream, I feel like I haven't understood that. And then I tell myself, stupid, of course you don't understand it, because it's a different world. And, and I think that that both, it, it proves, that it proves to me at any rate, that if there's any plausible uh, area of our lives that's going to open up um, the next world, it's the dream world. And that goes back to the animus. It goes back to primordial religion.
Yeah, I was conflating it because I, I, I knew I couldn't become too specific or it would give things away. So I was, I was conflating the, the sort of Buddhist Hindu with the modern idea of oblivion and with the, and I was also going to bring in Hamlet. I think Hamlet is really, is, is, is a very important text because what Hamlet desires is nothing. He wants, he wants to, to get into a state of not being. But he, but he says dreaming is the problem. So, not I think that's going too far. I think that you want your cake and eat it too. You want you want to you want to you want to give up the suffering, but you want to have a sort of cognizance and a, a kind of. But you want to go, you want to find a sort of middle way between oblivion. But why not? Why not just give, you know turn your back on the oblivion door and go through the the one that Swedenborg thinks exists? That is. Wasn't he, didn't he show doubting Thomas the wounds? I mean, so the, the well, the, the, I think that they would not be happy, the, the fundamentalists wouldn't be happy. They would want to say that uh, Christ, when Christ was resurrected, he was resurrected in the flesh as body. So it's resurrection of body, not, not uh, immaterial. They have trouble with it. And, uh, but th 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 then they, th that's a kind of that's another division. If you if you don't think that Jesus came back in the flesh, then it, it's not grounds for resurrection. You see. So then then it would be playing into Swedenborg's court. He would say, yeah, it was. I mean, he could use that if uh, he wanted to counteract the resurrectionists. I've had just two more. Let, let, let them in the stripe jersey. What's that? Dreaming is traditionally, traditionally, it's all a dream. Yeah. Yep. Um, so this image dream world uh, that you're suggesting or proposing to be the unmanifest. Yeah. Would you say that that's an individual experience or is that something that's shared more collectively? Because uh, it sounds like we're going from the face of dreams, that everyone gets their own very individual outcome. No, no. I mean, Price's idea, which I think has a lot to recommend it, is that there would be telepathic communications between uh, the, 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 the consciousness, the beings that have consciousness and image bodies. And the interesting thing is that one of the people working in the field has produced some prima facie evidence of tele, tele, telepathic 
communication between dreamers. And that again, now with this kind of work that's being done, that could be given quite a hard edge. A hard edge. What's that? It's this book, uh, there's a book called Lucid Dreaming by Robert Wagoner, W-A-G-G-O-N-E-R, and he has two chapters on telepathic communications between dreamers. You see, it, it's the kind of thing that you could verify in the hidden receipt or queen's secret way. If you, if you, you could set up where one lucid dreamer is at to, uh, to, to message no. So that it, it has a possibility of being verified. Madam there. Yeah. Well, it wouldn't be an I mean, that, that's the Buddhist idea that the, the self is an illusion. But that's, in a way, um, what they hope, because they hope to, to uh, overcome the illusion and go into nirvana. Well, the Swede, it's a, actually an interesting question, because Swedenborg is not a Cartesian, but neither is he a believer in the, the mind or the soul as a kind of uh, subtle body or astral body or breath. He, he, he was trying to get at early on that, that he is neither material It's such a best. I'll tell you the best place to go for this is there's about a five or six page account of Swedenborg in C. D. Broad's lectures on psychical experience, and he tries to, uh, and he's very good at kind of. Uh, he's a good, good, good historian of philosophy, so he knows his stuff. Put Swedenborg in a helpful context. Look at get that on the net. It was in the 1950s. You, you'll, you'll get the best account, I think, of the self according to Swedenborg. We must keep it. Just two more. I, I think you will put your hand on it. I'm not sure what to say, but I'll tell you, this uh, uh, Jung is interesting 
because he, he says that we Westerners can't really understand the East of Brahman consciousness, which is a kind of collective consciousness, that we, we are two kind of fixed individuals. Um, consciousness. Right, but 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 uh, I would be I'd be very critical of the we there because I don't want to go into a state of undifferentiated consciousness. I don't want to. I don't want to achieve moksha. I don't want to achieve Brahman consciousness. I want to continue because I. Okay. Any, any comment? No, I'm, I'm okay. Thank you very much.